Oh, he's the cutest. Oh, hey. Say hi, Jessica. Hey. He's so good. He just loves being around you. <laughs> yeah, he's good. He's, he's very good. Not not much trouble at all. Good morning. Oh. Good morning, Kay. Hi, Kay. <clears throat> hi, hi, Anita. Hi. Hello. Good to hear your voice. So it might be confusing. We're going to have three Russells on. Ooh. Oh. Really? That's a lot of Russell. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, nobody else is jumping up and down to volunteer, so I guess we're just... Uh, uh, we, we, you can't see me, but I'm jumping down. I'm jumping up and down. <laughs> I'm trying to try. So we had a visit uh, from Addison, who is our niece, and she read for us uh, Psalm 100, and we want to share that with you now. Psalms 100. Make a joyful note unto the Lord, all he lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with sing. Know ye that all that the Lord, he is good. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of pasture. Enter his enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. And the truth was endless to all generations. So today we are beginning a new series. Uh, it is a series designed by the Bible Project, uh, which I found uh, their resource just recently, and I was really taken with this idea, this theme. The theme is exile, um, and it's really an important theme in the Old Testament. Our reading today is from the second book of Kings, the 25th chapter. Being conquered and exiled was the community experience surrounding the creation of the Hebrew portion of our Bible. Other stories are variations and metaphors for this experience and were used by people seeking meaning for their suffering. The Jews were persecuted for their faith and for clinging to their identity while living in a strange land. In the ninth year of his reign, in the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. They built siege works against it all around. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month of the famine, the famine became so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city wall. The king with all the soldiers fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls by the king's garden, though the Chaldeans were all around the city. They went in the direction of Arabah, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered, deserting him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, who sent who passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah. They bound him in fetters and took him to Babylon. In the fifth month of the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the, the captain of the bodyguard, the servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. All the army of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had defected to the king of Babylon, all the rest of the population. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest people of the land to be vine dressers and tillers of the soil. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. So the theme of exile 
is really very uh, much pervasive in the Old Testament. Um, there is a way in which so many of the stories are metaphors or are in some way parallel to the experience of the exile. Um, so this story of the people being conquered and being carried away to Babylon um, becomes the paradigm for looking at other stories, such as, for example, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. The story of Adam and Eve is that they are placed in a beautiful land where they have everything they need. It is a wonderful land to get from God. They are given one rule to follow, which was not to eat of the fruit of one tree. They disobey that rule, and then they are exiled from the Garden of Eden. They are sent to the east of Eden. Um, so that story, when it was being read, was being read by people who had that experience of exile. And those people were looking for a way to understand what their faith could teach them about why they were in exile, about what to do being in exile, how to live as God's people in exile. Um, so to try to understand it through their religion and to try to have their religion, their faith help them through that time of exile. Um, so other stories are parallels, they are metaphors um, for this experience of being conquered and being carried off, of being dispersed, of being taken into exile. The story of Joseph and his brothers, um, then going on into the story of Exodus, where the Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt, um, also is another parallel for this story uh, of being captured, of being taken into um, um, servitude, of being enslaved, uh, of being held in a foreign land. Um, there's a parallel there. For us in our lives, um, we can find each of us in our lives somehow a parallel experience. For example, the pandemic. Many of us are feeling a sense of exile from jobs that we can't return to, um, the gym that we can no longer go to, um, family that we haven't been able to uh, visit, vacations, uh, trips that we haven't been able to take. Um, we are, in a, in a sense, exiled from all of those things. Um, breakups in a family, um, you know, being dislocated from your home, um, having to migrate to a new place. Um, all of these are parallels to these stories in the Old Testament of exile. Um, and it continues into the New Testament. Um, you can continue to see that um, being played out in the New Testament. And that's something we're going to be examining. Um, and anytime we're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, these two are inextricably bound together. You can't separate the Old Testament and have a New Testament that stands on its own. Um, there are actually people in the early church who said, let's leave behind the Old Testament. We have a new Bible for Christians. And, you know, that was discussed and debated and it was decided that it was a heresy. Um, and at its roots was anti-Semitism. Um, which unfortunately shaped the church in other ways, um, but failed to remove the Old Testament, to remove the Hebrew scriptures um, from what we consider to be sacred scripture um, in our Holy Bible. So that theme of exile will continue all throughout of the Bible. Um, certainly in the book of Revelation, again, uh, these themes are coming up. But in the Gospels, Jesus coming into the world, all of that can be understood through this larger context of exile. Um, I've used the example um, to try to get across this idea to people that there are metaphors, um, things that are parable, parables uh, explicitly, but also other stories in the Bible can be understood as metaphors. Um, I use the example of Godzilla. Um, so for people who don't know, Godzilla is a giant lizard um, who tears through Tokyo, knocking down buildings because he's as big as a building itself. And he breathes fire uh, onto the city, uh, destroying the city. To know the history of when that movie, which has many iterations now, to know how it started, its genesis as a, as a, as a movie, that it began in Japan in the 1950s. That the people sitting in that theater had within their life experience, their city being destroyed, being burned. And you know, watching it today, if you don't know that history or if you're seeing a later version of that movie, 
Um, there's no clue for you in those early movies that would say this is a story that is helping us to understand the war that just happened. Um, this is a story um, that is cathartic for people who watched their world um, be destroyed. The people who saw Tokyo being destroyed were sitting in the theater watching a monster come into the city, knock it down, breathe fire on it, burn it up. Um, it is a metaphor. Uh, what they've experienced. It is, a, it is a way for them to think through what they've experienced through a story that is exploring that experience in a parallel, in a metaphorical way. Um, so the Bible has these metaphors um, that are ways in which we can enter into uh, an examination of something and think about it in an ethical way, in a spiritual way, um, kind of take us out of the experience we're in immediately but then hopefully then reconnect us to it as we apply the lessons that we've had. Um, so I think this experience, um, this uh, series um, on Exodus, uh, I'm taking from the, uh, the Bible Project, as it's called, a resource that I found recently. Um, I'm probably going to, to make some changes to it, um, because there are you know, many, many ways in which you could explore this theme in the Bible. And I've thought of some that I, I, I would add to it I'll probably replace some of the uh, portions of scripture that are coming up um, with some others that I've thought of. But um, this will be a very interesting series. And this is a new series that we haven't done before, I haven't done before. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, some of you have a newspaper that you get, uh, the Westmore News. And this is the Port Chester version of the Westmore News. And there is also a Rybrook version of the Westmore News. Um, if you get one or the other, um, you're not getting something identical, uh, that's for sure. Um, so there is a, an opinion section, and the local clergy often come together um, to write uh, a letter. Uh, I'm just going to read it for you. The title is Much Work to Be Done. Local clergy respond to racial deaths and police reform. Once again, we are writing another clergy and community leaders letter about another instance of hate propelling violence and murder. Attacks on people motivated by hatred of their race, gender identity, religion, or sexual orientation have been increasing, and the connection between rhetoric and these acts could not be clearer. Concerted efforts to address the ideology of hate must be joined by our elected officials and religious leaders of all parties and faiths. Complaints about violent protests need to be matched with support for peaceful protests and also vocal concern about the reason for these demonstrations, namely violence motivated by bias and excessive force by police against black and brown communities. The shooting of Jacob Blake is another senseless escalation, and we now see vigilantes violently attacking protesters asking for justice in this case. White nationalism is an evil we all need to call out unequivocally and alt-right and racist groups have been allowed to spread their sick ideology and violent urges for too long. We are seeing that small Midwestern communities are no less susceptible than big cities or deep south, and no town, county, or village should imagine it can't happen here. Everyone needs to get involved in police reform in their own community, as well as work for reform in the way the federal government has influenced the criminal justice system all across America. Following George Floyd's death, protesters have asked for reforms that could help prevent such needless deaths, especially de-escalation techniques. Training in those techniques has broad and bipartisan support, and failure to adequately train and require such techniques can result in a killing such as happened with the police in White Plains in 2011. A federal judge dismissed several claims against the White Plains officers in 2013 in the killing of Kenneth Chamberlain, largely, largely based on qualified immunity. In 2018, the US Justice Department closed its investigation of the incident, concluding that there was insufficient evidence to charge any of the officers. The US Court of Appeals recently revived claims against the officers, but it remains highly uncertain whether Chamberlain's family will see any measure of justice for a senseless death that should never have happened. There is so much work to be done to address this problem at the root causes. 
the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, on the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. As local clergy and community leaders, we join together to respond to the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and others with a persistent effort to denounce all such violence and to build programs to meet the needs of all the groups and to encourage more dialogue and cooperation among our congregations and among the larger community. And it is signed by Reverend Kathy Genis, Rabbi Ben Goldberg, the Honorable Joan Grajinwa Thomas, Reverend Patrice Kemp, and myself. Um, so I thought that that was um, a good letter for us to put together. Um, we've worked on a number of these letters, uh, certainly over the past 10 years that I've been here. And they've not been, you know, just bland platitudes. Um, they've not been just um, sentimental um, responses of concern. Uh, we actually had one clergy member who um, wanted to change the letter in a way that we felt would have just watered it down or really taken away the point that it was trying to make. Um, so when we write these letters, we're not trying to avoid controversy. We're not trying to, um, you know, just appeal to the lowest common denominator. I think this letter and many of the letters that we've written over the years um, really speak with an important word of wisdom um, that we bring to bear from each of our traditions and with kind of a direct commentary on something that's going on in our society and some action uh, that we feel needs to be taken, um, that there is some concerted action that needs to be taken on a, on a specific issue. So I'm glad that that letter is there and I hope, uh, I hope if you don't get to read the Westmore News um, that sometimes you find a way in whatever community you live in um, to keep in touch with what's going on and to find something like this which is a platform for local leaders um, to speak and to share and to connect. So let us pray. Dear God and Father, creator of all, help us to see our community of creation, to see you as our Father and we your people. Holy be your name. Form us to be an image of your grace. Give us this day our daily bread. May we strive for a humanity where there are no poor among us, as it says in Deuteronomy. Help us to be humbled by your grace and renewed by your forgiveness, to be a community forgiven and forgiving. Save us from trials and temptations. Strengthen us by your holy word and by prayer and by study. Almighty God, may we seek your kingdom, search for your presence, and pray for your reign to take root in our lives. Your kingdom come. Help us to understand power and glory as you would have us understand them and to live by them. In your holy name we pray, dear God and Father, amen. The peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all. And again, this is peace with you. <laughs> Thank you so much for continuing to give offerings to the church. I know it's a strange time, um, but you are finding new ways to do it, whether it's sending in your checks by mail, and you can send that to the church at 761 King Street. Um, Quick pay with Zelle. Very easy to do online, you know, either online or app. Just look up Donna's email address, spelch at msn.com, or Venmo, even faster search out at St. Paul's hyphen Rybrook. You'll see Laura's name and you can donate weekly that way, quick as a click of a button. 
So thank you so much. Thank you, Pam. Let us pray. Good and loving God, we rejoice in the grace you have shown forth in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. As you have blessed us with your gifts, may we share our blessings with others. With all creation, we offer our praise and thanksgiving to you always and everywhere. God of hope, faith, and love. Amen. Amen. And we pray together the prayer that we've been studying. Make us bold, we say, to pray a prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So let us pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you in favor and grant you peace. Amen. All right. Stay in peace, stay safe, and love and serve the Lord. Peace, God. God. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.